said talk to me, damn it, or else I'm gonna throw you in the fire! You stupid bitch, you filthy! <laughs> Welcome back to Flyover State of Fear. I got another great guest for you in Paul Shirey from uh, the, the former editor-in-chief of JoeBlow.com and the Beard and the Bald Pot Movie podcast and just all-around film journalist. How you doing, Paul? Good, man. Good. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. How um, How's it going? And uh, yeah, how's uh, how's Alaska and all the all that stuff? And, Alaska is rainy. It's rained Same. all summer. Oh, it's rainy here. <sighs> Has it, it rained rain. all summer there? Because no. Alaska is just Alaska's just done piss me off this, this oh, summer. Damn. Uh so yeah, it's just been rainy every day. It's pretty shitty. Um I'm actually gonna I'm, I'm moving from Alaska next summer. So this is my last oh, I've been here about? for twenty years. Damn. I'm gonna move to Utah, actually. Oh, cool. So my wife lives in, in Utah and uh, that's a longer story than you have for the podcast, but uh, so I'll be moving there next summer, um, <clears throat> and everything's in motion for that now. But yeah, I've been here for twenty years, uh, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> awesome! I'm Perfect. done with eight month long winters. I'm ready. That to go. is a long. Yeah, I, I have no idea. In Jersey, it's like a six month winter, and we're done. So you still get it. Still gets cold on the East Coast. Though. Oh, it gets very get cold. Cold as shit. Yeah, I used it, to live in Chicago, and. Holy shit! Oh, it's cold. I had colder winters in Chicago than I ever did in Alaska. I believe that. Um, I, I lived in. Um, I went to school in Pennsylvania, and during like the coldest it ever been, and like our uh, olive oil froze one semester. Wow! Because my roommates <laughs> refused to pay, you know, put the heat on. So oh, I understand wow. what you mean. <laughs> um, my room was heated, but like everything else. So. Um, <laughs> But anyway, thanks for joining us on the show. Um, you know, I know you're a fellow uh, just movie person and obviously have an affinity for the horror. So I figured, why not? Yeah. Invite yeah. you on um, anything before I ask you, because it's rare I even have a I have a like a movie more journalist on anything going on in the like exciting things going on in like the movie world or more of like horror world that you're that you want to uh, highlight. Uh, you mean like news wise? Yeah, I, I just like anything out. I feel like it's a good time for horror. Well, yeah. I mean, honestly, like I would say for, I would say for right now, like the one thing I'm looking forward to is is Halloween ends. Um, uh, I, I actually, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm in the the minority here, but I actually really loved Halloween Kills. So um, you I watched are, it a couple times. All right, so we're gonna be fighting this, but I did not. I couldn't hated it. <laughs> I, I loved it. I just thought it was like fun. It was gory. It was like, you know, I, mean, I had a good time with it. That's it was, good. It was fun. That is a good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'll never stop anyone from enjoying it. I hate, I'll hate watch ends. Um, <laughs> you know what? My thing with that whole, like, uh, the whole new Halloween's is just, I wish they either went completely wacky or like, I just wanted them to pick away. Like, like they, like, yeah. It was all too serious and then didn't. It was like either be Halloween 3, which I love. Or yeah, Halloween like 3 is so underappreciated. Go the, and that's like what we're going to talk about today, yeah. actually. Um, so anyway, that's good. Watch Halloween Kills and we'll talk, or ends and we'll talk <laughs> about it. But I, I, that's a whole different rant. Um, but anyway, so. I don't think, but here's the thing. I don't think the Halloween reboots are necessary by any means. So I'm not really beholden to them. And the thing is, like, I'm very open. I love so many of the Halloween movies. I, I like Rob Zombie's Halloween movies. I love his first one. I like, I like all of them. Yeah, um, I, like his first I think one. Halloween 2, I think Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 is another one of those movies that's deeply underappreciated because it's it's really... Halloween 2 is actually more of a Rob Zombie Halloween movie. The first mm -hmm. Halloween is very much him kind of towing the lines. Whereas Halloween 2, like we were saying, like pick a lane, Zombie really just goes nuts with Halloween 2. I'm not yeah. saying it's great, 
But it's more Rob Zombie than the first movie. And I do appreciate that. I'd rather see a director to stick to the originality and go with it and or that than what we got there. Like, yeah, in the Halloween suit, like, I'm not trying to be any purist here. I'm a big fan of H2O. Like, I think that's a a better lore story than Halloween. My, just the the Halloween 2018. So I get what you're saying. Yeah, Halloween 2, Rob Zombie's, I did revisit it last year. And I had a better appreciation for it than when I like I saw it in high school, and um, you know what? I it's not even it's not even uh, uh, genuine because when I saw it in high school, we got super stoned before we went to the theaters. <laughs> I had no idea what I was watching, <laughs> and I can't handle you know that's how to begin with. That's the beauty of movies. It's it's kind of like the 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 tenet to my philosophy about movies is that they grow and change with you. You know, the movies that you watched as a kid, movies you watched as a teenager, the movies you watch in your twenties, thirties, forties, they change, yeah. you know, they change each time you watch them. You're not watching the same. You think, Oh, I'm going to put this on cause I love it. And then you watch it and you're like, wow, that movie just hit totally different. The reason it hit different, the movie didn't change. You changed. I agree. And that happens. And it's the beauty to me. It's why it's why film is such a, this this amazing fluid art form that you can watch these movies again and again and again and they always have a different effect that you could say the same be. about a painting on a wall right yeah. you could say, well, i saw that painting and it moved me this way and that it can still have that effect but a movie is a much longer investment you know you got about an hour and a half two hours sometimes longer and it's telling a story with characters and everything the people that you relate to the people that you cheer for that can change. That might and be. It frequently I love, does. I love that. That might be the most poignant thing anyone's ever said on this podcast. <laughs> um, no, that that's 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 actually absolutely a hundred percent agree, and it's perfect. And uh, I always encourage people, and I try not to sound like like a pompous asshole like when you're talking about. It, it's like, oh, something you loved as a child. Like, if you revisit it, like, be careful and have like just because. If I don't like it, that means I probably watch. If I'm talking about as things as a kid, if I don't like it, that means I watched it as a third year old adult when you saw it as a twelve year old. Yeah, of course. You, yeah. Of course, you thought, you know, Norbit was hysterical when you were eleven, right? <laughs> or like those, or like those, like lane of spoof movies. Um. Uh. Anyway, I've had that conversation recently, so I love that you said yeah. that. Um. That brings us actually into like, uh, one of my favorite parts. Uh. So any new listeners. Uh, what is your horror origin story? And that can mean anything. Just more like, how'd you get into it? Or not into it, I like to say, because I've had a few guests who aren't into horror movies. It's interesting that, I mean, it's a, gr- it's a great question, really. Um, and it is a, it's a complex one for me. So as a kid uh, growing up, I, I, w- I was scared to death of horror movies. Sure. I didn't like horror movies. They scared the shit out of me. Um, and I wouldn't watch them. Uh, my brother and my dad loved horror movies. They would watch them. I remember uh, this is back in the VHS rental days. They rented uh, Hellraiser 2 Hellbound. Yeah. And I remember I watched like 10 minutes of it. Ooh. And I, ra- I ran out of the room. I was like, I couldn't watch it anymore. I was like, dude, this is freaking me out. I didn't run so, out crying. I was just oh, like, dude, it's like too much for me. Like, I can't. That's this, a this gross. Is too much. That's a gross <laughs> one. Yeah. It's yeah, super bloody and gory. And I was just like, not. I just wasn't prepared, truly. Yeah. Um, but then like in 1986, that's the summer of 86. I remember, you know, my dad and my brother, like, let's go see aliens. Mm. And I was scared. I was like, no, I don't want to see this guy. Aliens. That's scary. <laughs> and then I remember a, a couple months later, I actually went and saw aliens in the theater and I loved it. Like I woke, I was like, holy shit, that was fucking amazing. I love it to this day. It's, yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's, a, it's almost um, a perfect film and it's an action movie too, but it blends. I know. It's so, yeah. It's, it really is. It, I, I think it's. I don't know. Maybe it's James Cameron's best. I don't know. It's, it could be. But um, so that was kind of a shift for me where I was like, okay, well, it's not that bad. Yeah. Um, and then I was a little more open to watching scary movies after that. And I remember, you know, I would watch them here and there. Um, I think my dad had, he had rented uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, which is the worst of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. But and I was scared to death watching it. Like, you know what? As I, I was kid- so scared. As a kid, though, the, the nightmare, and I think if you credit as a child, the, there's visuals. Like, I think kids see yeah, visuals. Yeah. So the visuals well, of yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street get 2. Get story. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, so, like, my wife does And you're not attuned. Yeah. Like, my wife doesn't do horror movies. So, like, I know if there's visuals in it, like, just stay away. But if it's, like, walk around, it's more of a creepy story. Like, you probably could, you probably could 
fuck around in the background and sure. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to compare her to a kid. <laughs> um but like <laughs> no, it's the same thing. I, I have the the same and that's why I wanna always ask my guests this question, because it it's similar to my experience. Like was scared of things, always liked scary things, but didn't like watching, right? Like I like talking yeah, about yeah. it and being afraid of this shit. Then I saw Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. I was like, oh, this is really fun. I could laugh, like, I, I, it's gross, but you could laugh at it. And then I got pulled back, kind of like your, uh, kind of like your, kind of like with your um, Hellraiser 2. Like, I watched House of the Thousand Corpses a little too earnestly. Mm, yeah. It's like, nope, I need to take a step back. So <laughs> that's why, because it was like, what is this? I, I was, you know, watching cartoonish zombies. Um, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Alien. also with the thousand corpses is a is a tough one. That's a yeah. that was for me. I watched that as an adult, and I was like, man, that's a it's an ugly movie, but I yes. love it at the same yeah. time. I absolutely love it. How do um, we, but it is well, ugly. It is an ugly, ugly film it's ugly. that I love, and I like. I think children, it's good that like on their own, find an ugly movie that they're like that kind of fucked me up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but. Yeah, man, that's a great pick of like what kind of got you to like flirt with it more like aliens. It's uh, because I forget aliens is in the horror camp, right? Like, I love <laughs> Alien is a scary movie, it's all in house in space. Yeah, um, I've been watching the Shutter 101, um, like, like, uh, scariest moments, and they just covered aliens. And I was like, oh, okay, you yeah. mentioned it. I'm like, I mean, oh, there's definitely know. some scary, there's scary moments in aliens, it's definitely more of an action war with film. a face hugger. And actually, than, uh, than anything, but yeah, it's interesting. You, Those things are creepy. Yeah, it's interesting you picked aliens because one, and we're talking about the fly two today, which, um, uh, one of my first notes was the vibe of the movie is very alien aliens, especially the ending. Yeah, yeah. Um, so having said that. Uh, unless you have anything you want to add to your your origin story, it um because it is very like fascinating. Um, I'm just gonna go right into the fly, the fly two. Let's sorry, do it. On, the fly. Um, I from as my first watch. I told you this morning. I've seen the fly a ton of times. This is my first watch watching the fly two, and I think that is because uh, after seeing the fly two, that I liked it. So and this like this isn't a review show or anything like that, but um. I think it has the same stigma that you mentioned, or we mentioned earlier, Halloween 3, and like two of my favorites, Halloween 3 and Exorcist 3. Um, I think The Fly 2 might have that same stigma where people just see the sequel label and it's like kind of forgotten in time. Yeah. And then you talk to actual, like, I, I don't want to say like horror fans, but horror, they're like, oh no, like, I'd rather watch The Exorcist 3 over The Exorcist most nights. Yeah. So I think it's a George C. Scott. This might like fly too. It's such an interesting story. Yeah. So before we start breaking it down, I always like to pull the synopsis from Google because they're usually right or really wrong. <laughs> Let's um, hear it. I'm curious. So I'm curious. I, did, I did pull this from, and I usually don't pre read. I actually pulled it from the first Wiki, Wikipedia and Google because Wikipedia, Google really gave nothing. It's just like, it's a remake of a remake, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So the synopsis of this is uh, Stoltz's character in this sequel is an adult son of Veronica Coffey and Seth Brundle, a scientist who became a human-fly hybrid as a result of an experiment gone awry, played by Jeff Goldblum in the 1986 remake. With the exception of stock footage of Goldblum from the first film, John Getz was the only actor to reprise his role with another actress filling in for Gina Davis' role of Coffey or whatever you say your last name, in the opening birth scene, literally gives us nothing of this movie. This is all these wow. synopsis. And if Man, I go that's to, a terrible synopsis. And if you go to Google, just because I didn't even read that, I edited it down. The, uh, oh, you know what? The synopsis is, I must have Googled something anyway. I'm, we're going to skip past that. It's just, uh, uh, Bartok, the CEO of a research laboratory, acts as a self-appointed guardian of Martin. It just gives more if you Google it, but that didn't show up mm. earlier because I'm not going to waste time with that. All right. 
So that's the synopsis. <laughs> 1989. Uh, it's directed. <clears throat> it's what the fuck, why did I not write this down? Um, it's directed by Chris, Chris Wall- Wallace. Chris Wallace. <clears throat> yep. Uh, who was the special effects guy on the first fly and really is only film he directed. He directed one other and an episode of Tales of the Crypt in the same year. Yeah, this yeah, Fly Two's is only feature, so. <clears throat> but he was heavily heavily involved in special effects for mm-hmm. tons of movies. Um, but yeah, this is Fly Two is yeah. his only feature, which it's is good to me. Kind of a shame because he showed a, a lot of promise. I want to uh, Fly Two. I want to. Uh, thankfully, <clears throat> I I have them. I do want to go check because of Fly Two. I want to check out, revisit his episode of Tales from the Crypt till death. I just can't place what episode that is off the top of my head Um, is that the one with andrew mccarthy let's see i wonder if that's the one let's see um this is what everyone likes people googling this is the one with (laughs) oh oh that's a plantation owner tries a voodoo love potion i don't think that yeah there's i mean there is one where So it's not Andrew McCarthy, but uh, it's funny. I literally, before we were recording, was watching The Serpent and the Rainbow. So the voodoo motif is is alive and well here. Um, But anyway, um, so check that out if you can. But why don't you pick? Uh, Yeah, the one with Andrew McCarthy was loved to death. Yeah, there's a lot (laughs) of chill deaths. And this movie actually, like, the way it ends and anyone listening or listening to the movie podcast, there's spoilers. The end, run right to it, <laughs> is very Tales from the Crypt to begin with. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like the very, very last shot. Um, uh, but why'd you pick this? It's such a unique pick. Like, it, like it kind of was saying, <clears> like, it, uh, I love when things come out of, like, left field, right? For these so, picks. So, in 1989, I saw The Fly 2 in theaters. Um, me and my brother and I think a friend of mine went and saw it. And we were hyped uh, to go see it. Like, we didn't just, like, go and just buy a random ticket. We were like, let's go see the fucking fly, too, man. Oh, cool. Um, So, you know, uh, let's see. I was 12 years old. um, And I was like, dude, okay, this looks fucking cool. We saw the trailers and we were in. Like, we are like, this looks fucking cool. And my dad had actually took me and my brother to see the first fly. I think it was 86. They took us. They took. He took me and my brother to see it. And that movie fucked me up. Yeah. I don't see how. The fly doesn't fuck anybody up. Like when he barfs on John gets his hand and his leg, I was like, dude, my heart was like beating out of my chest Paul, as, like, as a kid. Like I was watching fucked me up. Leading up to this, like last week, I work from home, half day, I put the <clears> move I put the, the original fly up. I've seen it enough times. I grab lunch, and of course <laughs> it's the scene he's just, you know, th- throwing up on the can, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> This this leftover <laughs> food's really hard to eat now. Like, so it, I'm not very hungry now. Yeah, no, it's so <laughs> it's it, it's so visceral and like and like um. So it's interesting. Like a that you told me that you were like, yeah, my dad is into horror movies, but we saw the Aliens, and like a year later, you're like, all right, now you can handle Cronenberg's The Fly. Yeah, yeah, um, and and that was the thing. It was like you kind of like what you said well you watch house of a thousand courses like okay maybe i need to take a step back now yeah. the situation where dad's like well we saw aliens let's go see the fly and it was like oh fuck especially like, this like fucked me up especially like something like that because it, it i i know just from like seeing shit like that information of what the fly is right the golden one it's not out there in your advertising yeah you know yeah. it's it's yeah. it's uh and it's a slow burn so i'm sure you're like this is neat he's doing push-ups and yeah he's like, like a superhero like i remember my dad recanting uh talking about that movie recently and he clearly forgot like the really grossness of the ending <laughs> he was like he's great he's going to the bar and he breaks the guy's arm and doing i'm like oh dad i don't, I don't think you finished Movie. <laughs> you watch the end where he turns into a grotesque fucking yeah. fly creature and the flesh like falls this... off and he barfs on people and melts their flesh like this summer Jesus. so it's it's really neat the the fly two and the you know the theater experience because uh watching this for the first time today it's like it's interesting it has a little bit more of a pace right than 
Cronenberg's fly. Yeah, but it's yeah, still it moves. Just, it it it's, moves. It's it's not boring. The fly no, two. No. I'm not going to say it's high art, but it's never boring. No, um, it, it it's been, it was a really pleasant surprise. So we we um, it's not no, it's not boring at all, and it it um, but it still takes its time. Is kind of where I'm getting with it. Um, sure, yeah, yeah. So we, it, we, it it's got a it's got a it does have a bit of a burn. Yeah. So we begin, uh, kind of in the dream sequence that's now reality that we end the fly with. We. Uh, it's not Gina Davis, but it's Gina Davis's character giving birth to uh, Brundlefly, but a corporation is doing everything for her now, assumably that, um, oh, what's, what's what Bartok. Bartok. Bartok, yeah, it's Bartok, and then the, uh, her, uh, yeah, who's her smarmy, the smarmy guy from the first one. Shepherd. Yeah, that's uh, jo- John Getz. Uh, is oh, the- Borons. They're all like Borons, Bird Talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he, assumingly, he sets her up this way. Like, something's in her. But they birth. She dies on the, the table. Uh, fun fact, uh, Gina Davis was like, I didn't like the birth scene in the first one. If you're starting a movie, I like that. I'm out of this movie. That's the only reason why apparently she yeah. would do this. Well, I'd be surprised if she would come back anyways. Like, hey, will you show up to give birth and die? Like, <laughs> she's I, like I feel like at that, at that point, Gina Davis had enough clout to say, eh, you yeah. have to give me something more to work with here. Yeah. You know? like, and she's like a year removed or a year later from... Uh, <laughs> a couple of years. Yeah. From, no, a couple, no, a couple of years, years from off, this. So. And then uh, from A League of Their Own, she's like a year oh, away yeah, yeah. from it. And like... Uh, Thelma and Louise and all. So, shoot her, and you don't need her for you. you we get the the scenario. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she is. Um, so the movie's the the birth is born, and it is funny that, like I said, I was first watched one of my first noticed that I'm like that baby is fucking huge. They pull out, <laughs> and then find out like it is growing faster. <laughs> and it is a it is a movie. It is well, and it comes out movie. as like a cocoon type thing. So yeah, it's I like, mean, it is like you you're a father. Like I I'm not, but I know that baby. I'm like that is a six month year old baby. Um, <laughs> but, there's no surprise that she died. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, and then we just and then we see which I found really interesting immediately. Like they gave him they gave Martin his father's last name. Yeah. Instead yeah. of just burying that just like, kind of acknowledge yeah, they like straight up acknowledge it. And they're yeah. like, Yeah. Which is really Your neat. Dad I, was a brilliant scientist. Yeah. You know? So Martin Brundle is born and uh first for the for we get this little kid, um, I would say he's they they explain he's aging faster. So by the age of like one, he looks like he's like seven. Yeah. Yeah. And the kid actually at first, I thought it was the kid from Blank Check. Oh yeah, I guess he could. It looks like it's not. Um, but we get this really like, uh, you know, we learn a little more about what's going on and what uh, Bartok does, and like the kid doesn't sleep, but he's a super quick learner and he's a photographic memory, and he's that superhuman that Jeff Goldblum is in the first one, just as a child, and he's growing rapidly. Yeah, and minus the physical manifestation, though. He doesn't really have superpowers. He doesn't have super strength or anything like that. He's just very smart and yeah. advanced in every other way. Well, yeah, and he makes like a like the early part. Like you could have put this right in Honey I Shrunk the Kids with the fucking thing he made. Like, like he has <laughs> yeah. like it's a Wayne's His little helmet, helmet, helmet yeah. he's wearing. <clears throat> um, and it made me laugh. Um, when he is crawling through the vent, I'm kind of yeah, jumping yeah. ahead here. Um. First of all, it's the biggest air duct. And to give context, my dad is an <laughs> HVAC. So I grew up, anyone ever crawling through air ducts saying, that's not possible. You know how much shrapnel's in there? And like, every time I see it, I know it's just, you know, the movies. So it, it really made me <laughs> laugh that the kids crawling around in the world's biggest air duct. Um, so, but he does crawl through and he sees um, all the other test animals. Like he's encaged. Um, and he doesn't really know out there, but he does meet a dog that comes yep. into play. His, little, his friendly dog that he feeds and befriends. Yeah. I mean, and they then, were... uh, 
Because you see that, and they have a room, like, nothing, like, horror happens at first, except for that birth. Like, like, like which, is, a... which is nice, because what I really like, one of the, the more, the, the qualities I really like about the film is that these, the characters in the film are very endearing. Like, you actually yeah. like them. Like, the kid is great. He's actually great. Uh, oh, he's you know, five. For, for he's kid actor, He's, like, really good. Um, and even when Eric Stoltz eventually enters the picture as the, the more grown-up version, he has a certain quality about him that is it's it's endearing. Like you Eric. you like them. There it's not like, oh, I hate this fucking guy or yeah, this Eric. sucks. You're like, you want this person to like do well. You're like you want this little kid to be happy. You want him to have his dog. You feel you bad want, for him. Yeah, you want when he gets older, you're like, Oh, I want him to fall in love. I want him to have everything. You're not like, man, fuck this guy. You're like, no, I it's difficult in horror films, especially to create endearing characters, right? Because most of the time you're creating cannon fodder, you're creating mm-hmm. people to be killed and you, you want to have one emotion or another. Either you want to love those characters or hate them completely, mm-hmm. you know, because and something is going, something horrible is going to happen. And this uh, one you're rooting for <laughs> the opposite of the fly. You're rooting. You, I am rooting for Eric Stoltz the whole time. I'm rooting for, Martin Bruno because he is endearing. Yeah. And when we yeah. do get to him, he plays it so well. And you know, when he learns he even as the kid, like uh they attach uh uh Burb I was about to call him Burbank. Um Bartok. Bartok. But you know, as this father figure who he does look up to, obviously Bartok is up to no good because they're keeping this kid in captive just to study and uh, it was interesting to read that they did, you talked about aliens earlier, and they did structure the antagonists of this movie after aliens being like yeah, Wayland. Wayland Yutani, yeah. Yeah, so, but, um, yeah, no, that's a really great point, and uh, something I definitely noted, and I know they they wrote the part for Eric Stoltz. And yeah. yeah, he said no, and I think the script is pretty. It sounds like it was pretty terrible until it got to this point. And he was like, "Sure." Yeah, I went through a couple different, uh, a couple different, uh, really vastly different uh, takes. There was one where, you know, the kid where Martin was supposed to beat a bunch of other kids, and that all had different abilities, and <laughs> they were going to like escape and live on the outskirts of L.A. Uh, <laughs> and the director hated that concept. He was like, "No, no, no, I'm not Dream doing Warriors." That. Yeah, exactly. And then there was, um, yeah, I think there was another one. Uh, yeah, there was, I can't remember the other one. There was like a whole other concept too, but, you know, eventually they, they got it down to, to, yeah. to where they wanted it, which is, it's, I think is the best, uh, the best concept they could have gone with, honestly. Like, it's it's one of those, it's one of those, to me, it's kind of a slam dunk sequel concept. Um, I don't know that it's perfect in execution, no. but conceptually, I think it's it's pretty awesome. It's it's a it's a good it's good. It fits the it it fits the mold <laughs> of like the first one of because the first one's earnest. It's an earnest movie. Yeah, the characters are earnest, and you see the change. So we do get that, and he, like as still as a kid though, he meets with the dog, and he happens to one day crawl into them testing. We see the pods yeah. are still in action yeah and he they send the dog through the pods and it just completely mangles and mutates this dog he sees him he's traumatized and that's when we get the flash forward to eric stoltz yeah yeah when he's and, yeah and when we get to the when we get to you know he at five he's probably 25 yeah right that's about where eric stoltz ages supposed to be and uh you know not marty mcfly is what we might call him <laughs> and um you know it's funny i actually like jump like around if i remember it. i literally forgot eric stoltz was in mask and i was like <laughs> i was well, like this i was like this makeup when he was loaded in i'm like it kind of looks like like rocky <laughs> dennis and then i was like wait a minute <laughs> wait, wait a minute just a minute I mean, there was a period where Eric Stoltz was kind of like the it boy, you know? I mean, again, he was, you know, he was hired for Back to the Future. He was the original Marty McFly until they were like, it's just not working. But, like, you know, he was he was kind of an it boy for a long time there in his 20s. 
and he did make some good ones like some i i love some kind of wonderful um i think is a great like john hughes era 80s movie um and you know he's just he's got like little appearances here and there but he never quite like just exploded yeah. to the yeah. top you know but he's one of those mainstays where you go oh, that's eric stoltz yeah he's, and i think he's earned he's earned his accolades and his respect in hollywood and his place sure um as a result and I, I think fly two is is one of his his better roles from that period in his life i think it's you know it's it, a really fun cool performance i don't think it works if he's not um not endearing like yeah. right like if he's not charismatic he's not yeah he's not jeff goldblum on screen but he he's not supposed to be and yeah, I, I think that's what's great is he has he is different and that's another thing that's good about fly too it's not trying to be the first fly no it's, it's not like hey let's just remake the fly it's like well i was really. nervous not nervous i mean that's an exaggeration but i was nervous for that right like like watching i'm like okay well like we're gonna meet daphne zuniga and we're gonna relive the same events but now there's corporation involved and thankfully yeah, that is yeah. not what happened um so we do get that and around this time though his his father figure Bertok is like you know you're on your own here's your own apartment like you deserve your freedom and <laughs> that's the only naivety i'm like you're so smart and he, he couldn't pick that one up <laughs> but anyway he <laughs> they're uh they're using him now to do the research on the the, the pots yeah so everything's fun it but you're so smart and you have this connection Here's that. Also, here's recordings of your dad. And that was really neat to see of the way they used unused footage from the first fly. Yeah. And even the, especially of this time, uh, uh, from a tech point, like really well done redubbed of uh, over Gina Davis of whoever the actress yeah, yeah. was in her voice. Yeah, like yeah. it was pretty seamless because even today, like I've seen movies where they do that and it doesn't, you know, that it's yeah, not it as. Quite doesn't quite come together um so but while he's doing that he does meet a girl he's after doing uh zuniga like i think this is right after space balls yeah well mel brooks is a producer on fly too oh shit. and he actually recommended daphne zuniga uh having just worked with her on space ball so that's she came in and still read for the role but they were like she's in like yeah, that's she's... our she She's works. great. I love yeah. Daphne Zuniga, man. I, I mean, I grew up. That's an early crush, you know, from yeah. that era, like the eighties. Like, Super come on, cute. Like, yeah, I, I, um, it, I literally we said before. I literally, I realized today. I watched two Spaceballs actor movies today. I watched Serpent of the Rainbow <laughs> and The Fly Two today, and I was like, oh, oh man, <laughs> literally just happened to be Bill Pullman and Daphne Zuniga. Look at that. Yeah, <laughs> all in one day. Um, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, super, like, super good casting, um, and they play her just right, like, it's not the Gina Davis role, she's just, not even a love interest, like, she, he's like, well, I would just like a friend, because she's like, Yeah, I was right. gonna say, she she comes off like, yeah, sure, they, they you know, have sex and, you know, form a relationship, but it feels more like a friendship, it's like the only friend that he has, you know, you take the sex aspect out of it. You know, it's That's, it's a friend. Well, they they do fall in love to the worst like country song of all time. <laughs> that was all. That was one of those notes. For like, all right, this the romantic music playing for the dancing. Like, there was nothing better. <laughs> I almost feel like the sex aspect was a bit much. I feel like that's more of a studio thing. Or like, yeah, if we just throw needed. sex in there, because I don't know that it was needed, or it didn't have to be. Maybe it wasn't handled in the best way. It's just like, yeah, then they have sex. It's like, wouldn't the sex be kind of like a, that would be a, a bigger experience, I would think, for Martin Brundle. Where, well, yeah, he's you know, a five-year-old. Like, yeah, I mean, and, and he's like kind of, you know, locked away. Certainly he would have questions about it. He's going to develop and feel those emotions. But I feel like it was handled more in like kind of an 80s exploitive it way was. rather than a way that was kind of more thoughtful. As to his condition, I think that would have been just a little better. No, that's just, that's a good point. That. Um, yeah, I, I um, I didn't really think much of it. Uh, in that sense, it it definitely to me felt like this. Sh that was the shift of the movie, right? The media, you see that, and then that's where right after that she notices the band aid, and it's like, oh, you're you're mute. Like, what's wrong? And then he goes to the doctor to get checked out, and that kind of 
ex to me it felt like the maturity of him, which is sex, expedited the the yeah. uh, the fly process. Sure. No, I think that's um, a good that's a good point. I mean, that could certainly like I mean, he's definitely gonna like do stuff to his brain. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. So who knows? Who knows what the actual trigger was in that? But a big part of that too is that they were giving him these fake injections, yeah. these water injections, which. Uh, the one doctor missed his vein or whatever, and like you know, that's what causes the the cut or the the yes. sword to develop on his his arm, um, and that's what kicks it off where he starts to like look like oh what's going yeah. on with you man like, um, and, it, and then he does start to gain that physical manifestation, being able to jump and run and, and kind of give get a little, little bit of superhuman strength. And I really, I, I like really liked. Um, well, obviously the guy who directed is a practical effects guy, but. Um, almost more subtle his like um, the blemishes on his face and everything than like Goldblum's was yeah Um, but yeah it so but they do become friends and it is a really nice relationship Uh, correct me if I've like missed anything so far Um, but um, you know after that they uh he does notice i'm sorry right before that one thing we did miss i I, my timeline here um he finds out that they've been uh they've been keeping the dog alive for three years yeah and uh that is really cruel and inhumane it's just this this creature that is should be killed i mean it it, it shouldn't be alive but they have it I guess for testing purposes, and they have it in one of those old school pits where you know you can watch, and it was only like that gladiator like, <laughs> and um, and uh, but he sneaks in to sympathetically kill it because yeah. he is a put it out of its misery. And uh, to me, that we were talking earlier, that's the first scene I was like, oh, like Stoltz is playing this, and it's, it's coming off. It is coming off sweet. Yeah, someone else played it right, like. Not like a young Mel Gibson playing that role. Like I'd be like, he's just murdering <laughs> that dog, even if he's trying to be, you know. Well, the other names they had were like Vincent D'Onofrio and Keanu Reeves. I think were offered when when Stoltz turned it down. Actually, I um, think Mel Gibson was one of the ones attached to it. <clears throat> was was he in there too? I think yeah, uh, maybe he was. I I, I find I could I. It was reading something that it popped up. That's why I probably <clears throat> used that up. But Keanu Reeves was one of them. Like and. Once again, that young Keanu Reeves, I don't probably couldn't. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if like he could have given. I don't know. Maybe Reeves could have done it. Maybe be a little different. He's a different actor back then. That's the thing. He's a different actor now than he was back in the eighties. All I'm thinking is like Parenthood, Keanu Reeves. Yeah, yeah. So I don't Uh, know. I don't know if I don't know how that would have worked. So, but anyway, that like before a little bit. That's a little bit before the, the or the sex happens, but. That kind of kicks him <laughs> the off. Sex and his, happens. Yeah, <laughs> that's before the congrats. Um, but um, you know, he, he humanly, and it's a real connection. And uh, this creature, or when he is eventually, he does have a connection to animals and creatures, and it's shown all throughout this movie. Yeah. yeah. Um. So they have that, and then, of uh, you know. He, um, sorry, uh, we see the deterioration and then like, and then we get to him. He's actually like fucking around in the pots. Yeah. And that shifts pretty quick after these few scenes and he's not transferring, but he's collecting his, he keeps collecting his DNA and he does figure out a solution. Yeah. Yeah. He basically uh, scans his own DNA. Um, and then he figures out how to transport um inorganic items without problems so he transfers a phone yeah. and the phone works perfectly it all comes back together without he issue takes her, he um, takes her cat on the night they, they you know they get it on he yeah. transfers her kitty <laughs> and um, yeah. i was surprised that actually didn't even come back you know she was just, the cat was the cat yeah um so the one thing they don't show really though they don't show how he cracks it they just kind of show yeah, yeah, he cracks it. He figures it out. They don't go into detail. So apparently, in the uh, the script, or early on in the script, uh, John Getz's character, who was mm-hmm. the one for the first movie, the guy that survived, the only survivor, uh, if you will, 
uh, apparently stole like a disc the, that went to the pods that wouldn't allow them to work anymore. Oh. So that's like the so the supposedly the the missing link there as to why the pods they can't get the pods to work. Gotcha. But, um, so they just kind of skip over that though in the movie in the that's fly too. He's just kind of like he just figures it out. It's always so. interesting, right? When like movies like this, like when they make go out of the way to explain a lot of the science and then they leave out like the thing you are wondering. Yeah, they leave out the key thing, like, well, wait, how did he solve it? Like, don't worry about it. He's smart. He figured it yeah. out. Shut like, up. Um and he still <laughs> He's gonna turn brain. into a fly. Relax. We're gonna see it. And I actually think this looking fly is a lot fucking cool. I actually like the look of this fly better than Rundle fly. Oh yeah, it's a much the thing about the fly and the fly too is that it looks like a movie monster. Mm-hmm. That's what I love about it. It doesn't even really it's particularly alien. look like a fly. It just looks fucking cool. It's like, an alien. It can kind of be a fly. But it doesn't have wings though. I don't think. I don't remember it having wings. It's shot so, so much in the dark. I can't. I can't. I don't think it has wings. I got. It I never did. flies. I mean, that's the one thing. It never flies. I wonder <laughs> if, like, if they had made it today, I think it would probably have wings and it would fly. I'm sure but they didn't. One. I don't think. I think probably it was this thing like, dude, we don't have the fucking money for that. Are you kidding uh, me? Like, this fly doesn't fly. He jumps. I'm sure in the next few years we're going to be getting a our overly artistically baked mini series to do the fly again because it's not going to be a movie. It's going to be a a, t- a ten oh, yeah, part. It'll be, it'll be on Netflix or something. Yeah, yeah, and you're going to be like, you see it, and you're like, no, I got a billion dollar series to watch. Um, <laughs> so I did order. Um, this is how you know I liked it. I did order the Scream Factory. Uh, fly oh, nice. like five movie box set as i was watching this Sweet. um so but i'm kind of holding out for a 4k and you had yeah. asked me earlier you were like well how did you know why did you choose this movie you know one it was a movie i saw as a kid but then i just saw that it was on hbo max and it's hard to find like you can buy it in that box set but it's hard to find mm-hmm. as a standalone copy in hd anywhere and I was like, holy shit, The Fly 2's on HBO Max. I'm going to watch this shit. Oh, yeah. It's, it'd been years since it. I watched it. And I watched it. I was like, damn, I love this movie still. It's so good. Yeah, so. that's why I'm going to watch it. That's why I watched it. That's why I looked it up. Like, I'm a I'm a Blu-ray collector. So when I looked it up, I kind of knew a little bit of, like, it's hard. So I was like, I'm going to get this box set because those Scream Factory box sets, like, disappear within a year or two, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, 4K, they'll probably restore it. I feel like they've been doing that for the releases a lot. But so we get to um so now he's more becoming the fly, right? And I, I think this is like where the um and he's like picking at his arm and like it's it's the pussing and he knows that it's not normal and the, the scientists, doctors are like, yeah. no, no, antibiotics, and he's like, fuck that. Um and then Having said all of that, they immediately uh, 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 bar talk um, uh, industries immediately. Zafni Zuniga's character, they relocate her, and they shut him off, and they kind of like in panic mode. So, like, all right, yeah. the change is happening, and we need to contain this guy. But they don't do a very good job because she gets hold of him real easily. <laughs> yeah yeah um, well and he goes he discovers that he's being watched because she says she tells him she's like they 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 saw us having sex mm-hmm. he's like what and then he goes and like tears up his house and he finds the hidden cameras he finds the guys that are sitting behind there and that's when he discovers that the tapes that they have of his dad it like he starts typing in the different dates he types in whatever date and he finds uh, something with his dad after his father had already started to turn into the Brundlefly. And he's like, holy shit. And that's when Bartok shows up at the house and he's like, so now you know the truth. Like, mm-hmm. this is so what we you're going to We don't have to become. hide anymore. <clears throat> yeah, we're done. We're done and shooting water into your veins. Mm-hmm. You're going to turn like, what about the fly. shots? His head's water, son. <laughs> he's and... like, bro. You're always gonna be a fly. <laughs> that's the. I think that's the. You'll always be a fly. Um. So, but he escapes pretty quickly from Bartok. I mean, yeah, runs right out, 
and he he runs like I mean that's what I mean like she hangs up gets like they're hung up like no one works here named Martin then she calls right back and he answers that's why I thought I was like oh this is <laughs> that was like pretty goofy to me uh, but Brewbreaker who I also have a note in here um, should be Robert Loja you know they wanted Robert Loja for this role. <laughs> Uh, it just remind it really reminds me so much of like over the top. Um, yeah, it definitely has that kind of like red faced, angry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how are, how are we doing on time, Paul? I just want to make sure we're. Uh, I could do I could do another like fifteen minutes. Oh, cool. All right, so we'll uh, we'll run to the good stuff then with the with this right. for any of the listeners. Um, so. He does get to her her house, and she's like, she's ride or die. She's like, all right, I'm going to help you escape. <laughs> I mean, and he's actively, like, the prosthetics are coming on heavy. This is earlier I mentioned my note yeah. about, like, he looks like Rocky Dennis. Like, it, it's happening. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of, it's a different transformation than our, than our uh, gold bloom. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's more burn victim. Yeah. Uh, well, and it happens very fast, and he actually cocoons. Whereas, like with Goldblum's character, he doesn't cocoon; he just kind of falls apart. Yeah, so it, uh, it's yeah, a fun, it's very liberties. different. It's fun liberties are taken. I mean, it, it's a lot like like this. A lot of other horror sequels, like you know, you watch something like Pumpkinhead, right? Like it's every movie is a different looking Pumpkinhead. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so it's 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 a fun liberty they take. So he runs, and they run to um. They actually get to uh, John Getz's house from the first movie, and he's like, I don't have a hand. Fuck off. Like, yeah. it's it's truly, like, it's a good scene of the movie, and it's a waste of scene for the characters, because he just tells yeah. them to fuck off. Well, and he's kind of hilarious. Like, I think he's great. Like, the char- I remember being in the theater and everybody having a good laugh, you know, yeah. when he was, you know, his lines, he's like, like, I had no love for the man. <laughs> it's like, there's, like, a it's- lot of great. A lot of great little moments there, but um it's some good levity in the um yeah in the movie. And I mean it's the only connection you really have to the first film in terms of a character uh mm-hmm. from the first film and in the sequel. So but I thought it was a nice I agree, it doesn't really it doesn't advance things too much. I believe he says something about like, you know, like the pods, you know, could he, potentially save you or something. But he mentions the pods and <laughs> I believe this is where uh Martin reveals um he's like, Well, we need a set we need a another like human another to match human, yeah. to DNA yeah. and it'll be fine. Um but yeah, so then we go to a motel and then this is like this is the this is where in the full horror, we're in the full effects, everything is fucking awesome in that regards from here yeah. on out to the end of the movie. Um and when he really so they fall asleep together and she's comforting and then she wakes up in the night and he's in this really like dramatic like blue lighting and he's almost all fly yet and he pulls out his eye and he's actually i don't know if you noticed this or it was just me like then he does start talking like jeff goldblum yeah kind of has like a dark and there's a great line that he says that was used in the trailers too where she's like you're getting worse and he's like no I'm getting better. Like it's such a great, such a great line. It Stoltz is delivery with that line, everything, his mannerisms, everything. It's like almost like evil villain uh, kind of thing. And I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's the biggest change of his character in that moment. It's the first time that you see him taking power, you know, where he's like, he's no longer just like this kind of doe eyed guy that like, doesn't know what's going on. Now he's like, I know what the fuck is happening. Sure, I'll do my research. <laughs> like, you know, um, but perfect. Like, and, and he does that, and um they do get caught. He cocoons. They and they get they do get caught, but you said he takes power and it is creepy. It is a creepy fucking moment. I do love that one scene a little before that. Um where he runs past the truck like a fly. Oh yeah, and, and he's like kind of like hobbling, like yeah, yeah. kind of crazy style. It, it, you know, because flies flying at trucks. Um, <laughs> but back and then, but we go back to the the um the the Bortok uh, Industries, and 
Um, this is where I, I mentioned, I've said a billion times, this is where it becomes like alien. Like it becomes aliens and it has this like bond feel almost to it where like Bartok is just full super villain. And yeah, very know, much, yeah, like a bond villain at that point. Because one thing we failed to mention <clears throat> is while all this is going on, Bartok can't get into the computer for the research and to access the pods. Yeah. A guess of the passwords, one guess will ruin, corrupt the whole system. Yep. Shut it so down. they want to get the password from Zafni Zuniga, Zuniga and uh, Zafni, I just called it. Daphne. Daphne, <laughs> yeah, Daphne Zuniga. And um, so they're holding her hostage, basically. They're like the flat and he's in cocooned and he just starts fucking people up. He breaks out of the cocoon. <laughs> the cocoon looks awesome. <clears throat> it does. And if you, you know, uh, Chris Wallace, the director, how he has that background of VFX and he worked on mm -hmm. Gremlins. It, it's a very similar, like, kind of like concoction, the way he has, like, when the cocoon starts to open. Yeah. <clears throat> it's very similar, like, when, when, uh, when Spike is, like, melting at the end of Gremlins. It's a very similar kind of ooey. The bubble, ooey. right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's, it's, you can definitely see his fingerprints on there. And I think it's great. And man, I am just a sucker for practical effects like crazy. Mm -hmm. I fucking love practical effects. Mm -hmm. Um, just even if they're crude, even if they don't really work that well, I still love seeing them. But in the fly, too, they work great. And the fly, Good itself looks convincing he looks just great he's like, I'm not saying it looks like a like a, a, a real fly but it looks like a real monster no it feels like a mo it's a monster movie now <clears throat> i think the the difference between this and the first fly is the first fly i would never call a monster movie i don't think of it that yeah. way i think it's just way more of a horror i think yeah. i'm like That's it's a body horror, horror movie body it's, horror yeah it's visceral this is a monster movie absolutely i mean absolutely. it it's a monster movie without a monster kidnapping a woman and like, you know, they're not King Konging it, which most do. Yeah. It's a monster yeah. movie. And yeah. <clears throat> um, speaking of the practical, I'll just go right through it. Like the kills after kills and the crowning achievement to me is there's two head bursts in this movie. Well, well, I'm right. sorry. Once the, my favorite practical <clears throat> effect is when he spits on the one guard, and his his, his face starts ripping off, and it's it's yeah. kind of like the well, one he, in Poltergeist. He, he hits him, and then the guy, the, the guard, grabs his face and literally just pulls his face, yeah, eyeballs, it's, and everything off. It's so and good. And it is one of the most grotesque, it's horrific, so good. awesome, amazing scenes. Apparently, I read this. I don't, I don't know how accurate this is. Apparently, they had nurses at certain movie theaters when this came out for people to treat people if they like freaked out over the scene. I don't know how true that is. I, I don't know. Reddit, but It's on the internet. So it must be true. But that sounds like I remember watching it as a kid. And I remember me and my brother and my friend were all like, Holy shit. Did you fucking see that? It was awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> and the, the, here's the great thing about it. And I've watched, I've watched the fly Two twice now since it, since it was on HBO max, the, after he's laying, the guy is laying there and he just pulled his face off. His hands are all melt. The detail to that sequence is amazing because his hands are melted because mm -hmm. he just pulled it all, you know, he reached for his face. Of course you would, right? If that happened in there. to you. You see the bone in the tip. Yeah. And the great thing about it is the motherfucker is still alive. Well, like I the was... guards come in and he's laying there and he's like, oh. Yes. And that yes. is the the scariest creepiest part of that scene is chest. that this guy is still yeah his chest is still and, heaving and you like can you imagine him. being alive after that happens to no you? that's horrific love... that's horror that's and, and 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 the guards come in and they say <clears throat> like oh, we need a medic we need like, a medic and i'm like what is a fucking medic gonna do yeah but, like fuck and uh, i think the worst thing in the world would be for that guy to live Oh, wait, wait, like, I'd be like, do not fucking save me. Don't kill me, kill me or make me an extra on Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is like that to me, crowning achievement in this movie. And the other one is just the elevator head smash. The elevator head smash is uh, It's amazing. right up there with scanners as like <clears throat> this head burst. And it's, it's kind of hilarious too. Like I want you know, rewatching it. I remember seeing it in theater where like, we were shocked mm -hmm. and like in awe and like, just like well, they thought that was going to get 
cut, have to cut around it from the the MPPA. Yeah, the MPPA I mean, gave it an X rating, and then uh, I guess uh, Wallace resubmitted, said, "Hey, come on," and they were like, "All right, fine." Yeah, <laughs> and they it's didn't like, have to change it. It's like that had burst scanners and the original Dawn of the Dead. Yeah. And, it's definitely absolutely fly to as one of the best head smash yeah. scenes ever. And it's it's kind of Austin Powers-ish if you watch it now, where the guy's just, just kind of like ah! and they're like, fucking move, dude. And he's like, ah, I got I have to get my head crushed. Oh now that you call that out <laughs> next time I watch this, it's it's gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna think of fucking Michael McDonald in it. <laughs> Austin Powers. Um but that that happens, and like I said, this is the point really where it's it's just gun shooting around, and like Burtalk also is still being like, no, we have to keep him alive, and his, his hubris is just taking control. Well, and yeah, and and here's this is the problem though, <laughs> this is the problem with the fly too, is that all this money, this massive scientific lab, mm-hmm. all this shit, what the fuck was their plan? You know, like what was there? You know that it's going to shoot. You should know rather that it's going to shoot this, you know, acid burning Big, shit. Your, your people evidence of the it's father, going though. to be physically like, you know, stronger than everybody else. Like what exactly was your plan? Like it's, even when it was ingestating and it was in its cocoon, they're just like, they just have like one white lab coat going in there. Like, yeah, we're checking on it. You know, took some readings. Like, yeah, what happens when it pops out? <laughs> like, what was the plan? I know it's a, know? It's, it's a very half baked plan because they could have just worked on those teleport machines without the kid. And I having mean, he said, should have been in a protective room for when he pops out, he's already in a cage, right? It should no, be they like, have them in some fucking you know just side room. Nice studio like, it's apartment. Nonsense. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's, uh, it should have been like, it sucks to say this, like for like a kid or whatever born, but you're right. It should have been, um, like how, like, uh, it was like, like Quicksilver and like that, or like kept in captive in like the X-Men, right? Like, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, something, something that yeah. like contained him and he had to like, you know, maybe use his, you know, his, or, his, his intellect or something or, or his like childhood the, in that building to get like out, which s- Stranger mm-hmm. Things or whatever, like eleven, like like just you're in a fucking research yeah. lab and we're treating you that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just uh, it feels like there was it just it all kind of fell apart where they're just like, well, what can we do? I guess we can shoot it or we can die in place. I don't know mm-hmm. which one you want to do. So yeah, it's 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 a the movie. I will not say is a half baked movie in the slightest. The concept of these characters is a half baked idea. The villains are half baked. I yeah. would say. I would. I would say that the the whole. I would say that their plan uh, is not exactly well, fleshed out. Are you trying? To, what do you want to study to, him for? To tie you want to use him as a weapon? Do you want to like? To, do you want to like make more? Well, like what? What is the plan? To tie it back to earlier conversation, it's the Halloween three plan, right? You have a villain who's a Bond villain, right? Like Shamrock <laughs> Savant, a Bond villain. Uh, uh, Bartok is a Bond villain, and the plan doesn't make sense. Like in Halloween yeah. three, the plan doesn't make sense because time yeah. zones exist. Yeah. He's a, it's again, it's, it goes cool. it's a little Austin Powers. But it's, you know? it's, he's he's kind of cool. Doctor Evil. Um. So anyway, a lot of bodies are being thrown. Um. And Daphne Zuniga, like she knows he's in there, and he takes Bartok into the machine with him. And I'm like, oh shit, they're using him as the human sacrifice. Yeah, and the machine happens, and the, this is like the SWAT team comes in at this time, but they see Eric Stoltz come out, and he's he's in another like goose sack. And I, my only real note is, even though she's really gross that she's kissing him, just <laughs> from like the scenario, not just like, really, you know, like, but whatever. And in front of him though is uh, a Brundle Burtok, uh, Bar- Bartok, <laughs> Bartok fly, yeah. Bartok fly. <laughs> And he is, uh, and then earlier I mentioned, this is what I, lo- I love it because we fade to black and we see that and like whatever, they probably live their happy life or who knows, to my knowledge, they're cured. But we see all the doctors and scientists and everything researching and looking at Bartok in that pit that that dog was in. The dog was in. And yeah. that is, 
I keep saying Tales from the Crypt, that is Twilight Zone, that is Tales from the Crypt. That, that, that's a classic morality horror ending of... Oh, yeah, it's so good. Um, and then and, as he's, like, trying to feed, and he's, like, his tongue is hanging out, he's trying to eat the slop that they give him, and he looks up and he sees a fly land right on his yep. food bowl. Like, that's just right. great. Like, that's great, fun, like, you know, horror schlock. Like, it's it's good stuff. It's you know, that's like... <clears throat> I generally yeah. liked it. I'm glad you picked this uh, this movie. Is there? Um, uh, but even the schlock, I don't even like want to. Like it's definitely one that's going to go in my rotation. But I don't even want to call it full schlock. It's just it's a fun horror film that I think is a little easier watch than The Fly. Oh yeah, it doesn't lean in that body horror. Where like I mentioned earlier, like yeah. I, I could eat lunch in this movie. <laughs> um, it's true. Like the fly really is an investment. That is the truth. Like I, I know some people that can watch certain horror movies. They can watch like gore and stuff and eat a fucking cheese pizza. No problem. Um, and then there's other people like me and you that are just like, eh, you know, appetite is contingent on this one. So yeah. if you're going to watch the fly, you got to, you got to not only plan your time around watching it, but what you're going to eat. If you're going to eat anything. Yeah, I didn't. Um, do that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, anything we missed uh, during our, this conversation we have here? I don't think so. I mean, it's a good no. recap of the movie. Yeah. Um, I, awesome. I hope that, you know, I hope that even if just uh, one person uh, watches this and watches The Fly too, that's a win. Yeah, um, me I think too. It's, just, it's a great, it is really a truly underappreciated little horror movie um, out there that I think is, it's great. It's not one of those like, oh, it's so bad, it's good. It's like, no, it's actually legit no, good. And, it's, it's really good. And that's what I was expecting um, having no nothing about it was, I was like, oh, maybe like, I was like, cool, maybe Paul picked a so bad, it's good one. Like, a, I just yeah. cut, recovered one of those last episode of the show in the fog, like, um, but no, it was generally enjoyable. Thank you for picking this, and um, where can uh, where can everyone find you if they're looking for you? Uh, well, these days, probably the best place to find me would be on Twitter, uh, at Arctic Ninja Paul. So you can follow me there. Um, I'm currently working on my own projects, uh, a couple writing and drawing projects. So um, I'm not posting as much as I was, but, uh, you know, I do dip in and, you know, watch stuff and share my thoughts. I enjoy, you know, conversing with fellow fans such as yourself, which is how, mm -hmm. you know, you found me and I found you. So, you know, uh, feel free to hit me up anytime on Twitter, you know. Um, I do enjoy talking movies and, you know, kind of going on You're about very that good stuff. At it. <laughs> so <laughs> perfect. Um, yeah. And you can always find us here at uh, Flower State of Film, Flower State of Fear. Uh, stay frightful, everyone. Welcome to Flyover State of Fear.